Now guys, we like to think that engineers, they're brilliant, the best of the best. But what if I told you that most of them are just normal dudes like you, me, and Trav? And they absolutely make some serious mistakes. Today on Idealist, we're looking at some of the biggest automotive engineering fails ever. And we show you why you just have to be stupid to buy one of these cars. But I'm no engineer, and the closest thing that we got is YouTube's favorite master technician, Trav. Let's go. Now, I'm not saying these manufacturers were bad at their jobs, or that the cars that had the problems are bad. In fact, most of them are actually pretty good cars with just one major flaw. But I am saying that fire and cars usually don't mix, which is why you definitely don't want flammable gas to drip onto the hot parts. Something that Mazda sorta kinda overlooked when designing the Rotary RX-7. The FD RX-7 is one of the most beautiful cars ever built. We had to do an entire video on it just to cover the topic, but the fuel filter is in like <laughs> the dumbest location ever. It's basically between the rear subframe and diff sitting right on top of the exhaust pipe. Yeah, no, you heard right. A part that's supposed to be super easy to replace, that's full of flammable liquid, requires hours to get to, and it sits on top of one of the hottest parts of the car. If it ruptures, you get fired. If you don't replace it, <laughs> you get fired when you call in late to work again because you drive an unreliable rotary car. Which begs the question, between the apex seals and the nearly impossible to service parts, how can a car that's so bad still be so good? Of course, sometimes the whole car really is just bad, like the Ford Exploder. I mean, Explorer. We've mentioned it before, but at one time, the Explorer was the deadliest car on the road. It's on Ford Explorers, have been linked to at least 174 deaths. Word went out that the Explorer was linked to serious accidents. There have been charges. The Explorer is unstable. It just really, really liked to roll over and crush people. Ford blamed the tire company Firestone. Firestone blamed Ford. Regardless of whose fault it really is, engineers allowed a vehicle to exist that was wildly unsafe. And that's just one of Ford's big fails. Cause the fine folks at the Blue Oval, well they like to play with fire too. We'll get to the most famous example in just a minute. But in the early 90s, there were just so, so many cars that caught fire for seemingly no reason. Ford was especially guilty because the ignition switch in a ton of cars ranging from the Humble Crown Vic, all the way through their premier F-150 had faulty wiring. What would happen is your key would stop working and then there'd be some smoke. And then if you were super unlucky, <laughs> a lot of fire. A problem that Ford fixed instantly. Nope. No, <laughs> they never fixed it. And millions of cars are still on the road with faulty switches. And now, like today in 2022, Fords are still catching fire. What the f Pinto? Ah uh, yeah, the car that used to be the punchline of every automotive joke. Nowadays, it's mostly been forgotten about, which good. But it's also good to look back and learn a valuable lesson. Cheap, crappy materials plus flimsy gas tanks mounted where they can easily be destroyed equals a bad idea. You'd think that'd be something they knew before building the car. But hindsight is always 2020, am I right? I mean, really, what's a few explosions between friends? You might expect failure from Ford. After all, they start with the same letter. But Mercedes? Ah, uh, who am I kidding? Nope, you probably expected that one too. Car companies today are all about going green, mostly because it looks good in advertising. But that's absolutely nothing new, as it turns out. Since in the 80s, the German luxury company decided to help save the planet. Nowadays, a french fry oil burning old diesel is super cool, but back then it was all about avoiding the use of plastics. Mercedes, for some reason, decided the best way to avoid plastics was to use biodegradable insulation on their wiring. And hey, good news, it worked! Long before the car was even 10 years old, the insulation biodegraded itself right off, leading to shorts and fires all over the place. Whoop. See, that's a harsh philosophical lesson. So let's laugh at Citroen for a hot minute. They make this car called the Pluriel, which is a dumb name. And 
a dumber car, because it's a convertible that's nearly impossible to actually convert. First, it's hilariously difficult to get the roof off. Then when you do get it taken down, there's absolutely nowhere to put it. And once it's off, it's nearly impossible to put back on. Just a failure all around as you get soaked in the rain next to your weird French car. The Volkswagen R32 is a car that's pretty near and dear to our hearts, but even they are not without sin. For some reason, whoever engineered the seats didn't properly ever test out the design. <laughs> if they did, they would have found out that the awesome new heavily bolstered R Sport seats hit the sun visors when you fold them forwards, simultaneously breaking the visor and blocking you from the back seats. Not a huge misstep compared to some of the others on this list. I mean, it's not like the airbags go off for no reason or something, but still a fail from a company that should know better. You didn't really think we were gonna make it through this whole list without at least one Mopar, did ya? In the late 90s, the Chrysler boys were killing it. People were still buying up minivans quicker than they could make them. The Durango and second gen Dakota just dropped, the refreshed Viper had just hit the streets, and maybe most importantly, the company introduced the legend that is the Neon to the world. Just one small problem though. The airbags might go off when you turn off the ignition. Chrysler had to recall 125,000 cars and trucks due to a poorly engineered airbag control module that would literally cause the airbags to deploy when you switch the ignition off. Yeah, hey honey, I'm pulling into the driveway right now. Yeah, I'll just, I'll be in in just a, wow! Oh, Nissan. While I could rag on the CVT yet again, instead, I have something way more laughable. Let's turn our attention to the Xterra, which honestly is kind of a cool concept for an SUV. It's a small off-road ready vehicle that came from the factory with a pretty robust cargo rack. And if you wanted a sunroof, but if you got the cargo rack, one of the supports goes right on top of that sunroof, meaning you can't open it. And the only thing you get to see is a blocky chunk of aluminum. Real nice. Lincoln is a car company that I never really cared much about. They don't have the prestige that Cadillac does, even though, I mean, they should. And they never made anything that really excites me. I mean, old Continentals are cool, but no one writes songs about rolling down the street picking up chicks in an MKC. You feel me? Just as well, because if you had one of those fancy escapes, you might find yourself dying of embarrassment after you kill the engine trying to impress those chicks. See, the MKC, for some reason, has the engine start stop switch installed directly under the sport mode button. In fact, at a glance, the two look nearly the same. And that's not just my opinion. Ford had to recall 13,500 cars to make the shutoff button more obvious. Friggin' Ford, man. Still though, if we're bashing American cars, there's one fail that stands head and shoulders above the rest, at least to me. Because while Ford's catching fire and rolling over is dangerous as hell, it's actually Chevrolet's greatest failure that breaks my heart the most. Imagine this, you're a company that started because of a race car driver. Your premier sports car is synonymous with American success. And at the height of it all, you were building the cars driven by the astronauts. Then in 1980, because of poorly understood laws and a general IDK attitude, you release a flagship sports car that can be gapped by a homeless dude in a shopping cart. And it sounds like a turd fart. <laughs> okay, I get that the gas crisis was bad, but the Porsche 930 was fast, and the Nissan 280 was fast, and the friggin' Chrysler Little Red Express, a pickup truck, could absolutely rip down the straight which means there was no reason for the Corvette to be such a pig. Come on, GM. Okay, call back to the beginning where we were ragging on Fords for rolling over because a spin cycle was just all the rage in the 90s, the Mercedes A-Class, which was kind of a bull little baby Benz hatchback thing, became notorious for failing the moose test. That is, if you had to swerve to avoid a moose, you might lose a wheel. Or worse, the A-Class would just roll onto its side. Then you get to play a game. Hit the moose on your wheels, or hit the moose on your roof. All right, down to the last two, and they are probably the most shameful, because you know that these two German giants spent the most on R&D. First up, something you can ask B6 slash B7 S4 owners all about is the timing chain placement on Audi V8 engines. Just, God damn it, Audi. I know you hate mechanics, 
but this is a leaven of sadistic madness normally reserved for Disney villains. For those of you who don't know, the timing chain, or belt on some cars, is one of the most vital parts of an engine. Sometimes they need to be replaced. It's a normal wear item. They normally last between 80 and 100,000 miles. Some chains are supposed to be lifetime, but they very rarely are. Audi decided to cover it up completely and route it around some immobile components and, oh yeah, stick it on the back of the engine so that you have to remove the entire friggin' transmission just to service it. You wanna know why those 4.2 liter S4s are so cheap? Well, <laughs> this is why. But it's not the worst engineered part here in the ideal garage. Three little letters strike fear into every 996 slash 986, 911, and Boxster owner, IMS. It stands for intermediate shaft and specifically refers to a little bearing on the end of it that likes to fail. And when they fail, it's super, super bad news. Porsche calls it officially premature catastrophic engine failure. And they aren't kidding. Make no mistake, it's not really a question of if either. The IMS bearing will fail due to a serious design flaw. It might be 20,000 miles, it might be 120,000 miles, but it's a time bomb. Porsche knew about it and continued to use the bad bearing from 1997 to around 2008 or so, with the Boxster 911 during the early 2000s being the worst of the worst. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is why I have trust issues. This has been Ideal. What are some of your favorite fails that we missed? Let us know down in the comments. And after you do, go check out some of our other videos. Thanks for watching, guys. This is Trav, and I'll see you next time.